given to us in uh, the Word of God and also the other gift you've given us is your Son, Jesus Christ, and salvation paid for completely by His blood. And we just thank you for these gifts, and I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to appreciate what it is we hold in our laps, and I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be students of the Bible and to desire to know it and to know you more and more every day. And Lord, I just pray you guide and direct my thoughts and my speech. Lord, help me to be an effective teacher of your truth. May the teaching of your word today be a blessing and encouragement to those uh, that are here and, and those that might be watching on live stream. And we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our next subject, our next topic or section we're looking at here now is where did we get the 66 books that make up the Bible? Where did we get them? Uh, how did they come to be the books that are in our Bible? And if we go back and look at our outline real quick, we've covered inspiration, preservation, uh, different views of the Bible. Now we're going to be looking at the gathering of the 66 books. How did we end up with these books in our Bible? All right, <clears throat> pop quiz. How many books are in the Old Testament? 39, very good. And what is 3 times 9? 27. That's how many books are in the New Testament. A little fun fact there for you. But 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. Put them together and we have 66 books in the best book ever, the Bible. And so where did they come from? How do we get these 66 books? Well, we're going to look at that in this next section of our study on the Word of God. The Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew, uh, with a few exceptions in Aramaic. Hebrew is a very expressive and pictorial language, which is well suited to describing all the wonderful stories of the Old Testament. On the other hand, New Testament was written in Greek. Greek possessed a technical precision not found in Hebrew. Greek was the international language of the first century and was perfectly suited for the spreading of the gospel. So very two very, two very different languages, uh, Old Testament primarily uh, written uh, in Hebrew originally, and the New Testament written in Greek. Uh, both were languages perfectly suited for the time in which they were written, and uh, God makes no mistakes. It's not just a coincidence that all this stuff just worked out so well. God knew what he was doing in, in, in perfect time and in perfect ways, moved on different men through the Holy Spirit to write down the words that he wanted written down. As we saw here this morning, as we start, um, we're going to be a lot more historical today, so uh, we will get into some scripture, but um, I want to start with this to remind us that as we consider how these books came together and as how these books were written, every word is very important to us. Every word, Jesus said, we live on every word that God has given to us. Every single one of them is important, and so we need to remember that and just how precious the word of God is. Um, the Hebrew Old Testament, now this is the Hebrew Old Testament, if you looked, if you found an Orthodox Jew, they actually have 24 books in their Bible, or what they did. They, they only have the Old Testament. They do not accept the New Testament in any way, shape, or form. They reject Jesus as the Messiah. They believe Christians are heretics, and they want nothing to do with Jesus or the New Testament. Uh, their Old Testament, as we would call it, um, their holy book has 24 books. They combine many of the books that we see as separate, where like First and Second Kings, to them is just kings. And so things of that nature, uh, where they have 24 books in the Old Testament, where we have 39 in our Old Testament. Uh, the, the Hebrew Old Testament was divided primarily into three sections. You have the law, or what is called the Torah, and that's Genesis through Deuteronomy. Then you have the prophets, which they call the Nebhim, which is uh, former prophets and latter prophets, which constitute uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And then Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Hosea through Malachi. Then they have another section called the writings, which is called the Keth, Kethubim. Uh, these are poetical books, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. Uh, the scrolls, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. And then prophetic and slash historical, Daniel, Ezekiel, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So that's the construction of their Old Testament. So they have the same Old Testament we do, but it's just partitioned slightly differently um, than ours. Um, but they, again, uh, there are certain portions of Isaiah that a rabbi, a, a good, a good uh, upstanding rabbi, will instruct his followers never to read. There's portions of Isaiah that they are taught never to read. Ironic, isn't it? But those are the very portions of Scripture 
uh, that speak of Jesus and, and the promises of the Messiah to come and, and who he would be and what, he would, what characteristics he would have. Uh, and uh, so they don't allow them, they forbid them to read those sections of, of their, their own Old Testament uh, that they have. Uh, and they just poo-poo it. They won't talk about it. Uh, sad, because if they would read that, there might be more Jewish people that would come to an understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, but So anyway, uh, order of writings of the Old Testament. Order of writings of the Old Testament. The first book, the oldest book of the Old Testament. Does anybody know which book that is? Job. Very good. Job was written about 2150 B.C., uh, followed by Genesis through Deuteronomy in the early 1400s. Uh, Joshua was written somewhere before 1350. Uh, Judges and Ruth were around 1050 B.C., uh, Psalms was written around 965 B.C. Um, this date, 965 B.C., refers primarily to the writings that David did that contributed to the psalm. David, by far, is the largest author and contributor to the, the book of Psalms, but Psalms spans really over a thousand years because Moses penned some uh, Psalms in 1450 B.C. Uh, and, and all the way to Ezra in 450 B.C. So, there were some that were not penned by David, but, but the lion's share of this book of Psalms is penned by David under God's inspiration. Uh, and so that, that's that date, 965, is attributed to the bulk of when David wrote many, many of the Psalms. Uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, were written somewhere around 926 B.C. Uh, again, this date refers to Solomon and the bulk that he contributed to the book of Proverbs. Uh, and Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, but there were some proverbs that were uh, not that were added later by Hezekiah. It's around 700 BC. Uh, so then we come to First and Second Samuel, which was written around 925 BC. Uh, First Kings, First Chronicles, uh, around 848 BC, uh, and we have a uh, couple different things here. Materials uh, were gathered. These were the materials gathered by this time. Uh, Jeremiah and Ezra finished kings at the start of the Babylonian captivity, and then they concluded, they finished up chronicles near the end of the Babylonian captivity. So we have 70-year Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah and Ezra worked together, and during that captivity, they compiled what we know now as First and Second Kings at the beginning part of that captivity, and then First and Second Chronicles near the end of that captivity. Then we have Obadiah in 848 B.C., Joel in 835 B.C., Jonah 780 B.C., Amos 765 B.C., Hosea 755 B.C., Micah 740, also Isaiah in 740 B.C., Nahum 650 B.C., Zephaniah 630 B.C., Habakkuk 620 B.C., Jeremiah and Lamentations and 2 Kings 605 B.C., Ezekiel 593 B.C., 2 Chronicles uh, sometime before 539 B.C., Daniel 538 B.C., Haggai and Zechariah 520 B.C., Esther 476 B.C., Ezra 450 B.C., Nehemiah uh, sometime after 445 B.C., and then Malachi in 432 B.C., and that concludes the Old Testament books. Um, so these were all the different books written and when they were written. Um, something you don't see much anymore when you read articles, you don't see B.C. or A.D. anymore. What do you see? B.C.E. and C.E. Does anybody know what that, that means? Yeah, Common Era and Before Common Era. See, even in, even in our culture today, they're trying to get rid of Jesus. Because B.C. means what? And what does A.D. mean? Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. Uh, sometimes you read older writings and it say, in the year of our Lord, 1722. You know, that, that just, that, that's a Latin word, Anno Domini, which just means in the year of our Lord, or A.D. A lot of, a lot of people think it's after death, and, and it's about that same time frame. But, but understand, for a long, long time, our, even our dates were governed by Jesus. Um, if you look at 
If you look at the word history, what's right in the middle of it? T, the cross. And it's his story. And so for a long time, uh, our, cult, our society uh, dated things based upon the Bible. But now, uh, man is smarter and so they want to get away from that, and they, they think that they just want to get away from all that. And we see it's working so well uh, in our society since we got rid of the Bible in the schools and got rid of the Ten Commandments hanging on the walls of schoolhouses. It's working swimmingly, isn't it? Mm, maybe not. All right, <clears throat> so these Old Testament manuscripts, where were they kept? Uh, well, bef- the pre-Babylonian captivity, these Old Testament scriptures were, were kept uh, near to the ark. Uh, near, near to or, or close by the ark uh, where the, the priest could have access to them. Uh, and then during the Babylonian captivity, tradition holds that Daniel collected and preserved the scriptures and made sure that they were not uh, damaged or, or destroyed. And then in post-Babylonian, post-Babylonian captivity, tradition holds that Ezra brought back the scriptures from captivity and placed them in the newly restored and rebuilt temple. And that Ezra, Haggai, and Zechariah compiled the Old Testament books into their final order. Greek New Testament. This was written over a short period compared to the Old Testament, which was written over uh, almost 1,500 years. Uh, the New Testament was written in, uh, in about 50 years, from 445 uh, to 100 A.D. So a very, very short span compared to the Old Testament. Um, and the, who, who can tell me what the oldest book is of the New Testament? Nope. Nope. James. Galatians is close. James was the first New Testament book penned by James in 45 A.D. Uh, Galatians followed shortly after that in 49 A.D., First and Second Thessalonians were written in 51 A.D. First Corinthians was written in 55 A.D. Second Corinthians 56 A.D. Romans 57 A.D. Luke 59 A.D. Acts 60 A.D. Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon were written during a time span of 60 to 62 A.D. First Timothy was written somewhere in the time frame of 62 to 63 A.D. as well as Titus. Matthew, was, Matthew and Mark were written in 63 A.D. Hebrews was, was penned sometime in the period of 59 to 69 A.D. Uh, 1 Peter, 64 A.D. 2 Peter, 67 A.D. 2 Timothy, Paul's last book, was 67 A.D. Jude, somewhere between 66 and 80 A.D. Gospel of John, 85 to 90 A.D. 1 John, 90 to 95 A.D. 2nd and 3rd John and Revelation sometime between 90 and 96 A.D. And then that is the conclusion of the New Testament. So very, very short time span of the writing of the 27 books of the New Testament as compared to the Old Testament. So, once all these books were written, how did we come to have these 66 books in the Bible? Because these were not the only writings that were out there. There were other writings too, and we'll cover that here in a little bit. Uh, but the determination of the canon, how did that come to be? What does canon mean? It does not mean a big steel tube where you shoot things out of. A canon is an ecclesiastical, means in ecclesiastical affairs, a law or rule of doctrine or discipline enacted by a council and confirmed by the sovereign, a decision of matters in religion or a regulation of policy or dis- discipline by general or provincial council. So groups of people that had knowledge and understanding of what they were making decisions about got together and decided as we saw here we got the old we have the old testament being compiled and gathered together by prophets of god ezra haggai and zechariah prophets of god and we have books of the bible that god inspired them to write but they were god's prophets god's speakers of his truths and it would god used these prophets, these men of God, to compile and gather together the 39 books that we have or that we know of uh, in the Old Testament, God used them to bring those together. So again, there, you know, there's that canon of, of Old Testament scriptures. So by the time we have uh, the, it, the nation of uh, Judah out of captivity and back in the land of Israel, uh, as we, you know, we see the closing of the New Testament and then the 400 silent years during which God did not speak to the nation of Israel at all, until we saw Jesus 
Christ coming on the scene at the beginning of the first century, um, or the very, very, very tail end of, of what, would cons what we consider BC. There, different scholars di argue about that, but he was probably born sometime between 3 BC and, and 1 AD, somewhere, somewhere around that time frame. But all during that time, Malachi was written in 432 BC. That was the last book of the Old Testament written, and then there was 400 years. And we've talked about this before, America hasn't even been around for 300 years. Just imagine, just think about all the history that we know of, of our own nation. We think back to 1776 and just think like, man, that is so long ago. Imagine never hearing a message from a, a messenger of God for 400 years. But during that time, they did have the Old Testament. So that, that was settled quite a long time ago. Uh, and so then we come to the New Testament, and um, where we have, so we would need a canon uh, or a group of people that would agree on what books needed to be included in what we now know today as the New Testament. Uh, so what would they do? What would they do? What things would they be involved in as far as trying to understand uh, which books should be included and which books should not be included in the New Testament, what we know as the New Testament. Uh, well, there was tests. There was tests that they would issue against the different writings as they considered what books were to be considered in the canon of the New Testament. First one was authorship. Authorship. Was the book written by an apostle or someone under the authority of an apostle? Now, why are apostles so important? Take a look at Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. And Judas, the brother of James... Uh, nope, 6.13, here we go. And when it was day... He called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he called apostles. Simon, who he also surnamed Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. So Jesus had many disciples. We know at one point he sent out seventy, two by two, to preach the gospel in the regions around where they were ministering. But of those, of the many disciples, and he probably had far more than 70 uh, disciples, uh, we know at one point a lot of them left him because he started getting into some of the harder teachings, and uh, he asked Peter, will you also leave me? Because <laughs> where else shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. Um, so, but of the, of the many disciples that he had, he chose 12, and he called them apostles. These are chosen ones or, or ones ambassadors if you will these were ones where they had special authority given to them by jesus christ and there's criteria for <clears throat> the uh apostles uh we, if you remember in the book of acts in fact let's go there book of acts mm -hmm. acts chapter 2 and verse Verse number 15, Acts 1, 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue Alkadama, which is to say the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have companied with us, now pay attention, 
have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of his ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So Matthias replaced Judas as the twelfth apostle that Jesus had selected. Notice here the requirements he had to have somebody, somebody who had been baptized by John and somebody who had accompanied with Jesus and heard his, his teachings specifically. Very important to understand because to, in today's culture, you might meet somebody knocking on a door or talking to somebody, and they might start talking about their apostles. Mormons believe that they still have apostles today, which would be the leadership of the Church of Latter-day Saints the Mormon church. Uh, but here's a problem. L this is the biblical requirements for an apostle. Somebody chosen by Jesus, somebody who's walked and listened to Jesus, and somebody baptized by John. Now I might say, well, what about Paul? He's an apostle too, but he wasn't baptized by John. No, but he was baptized by a church member from Antioch. He was a special apostle for the Gentiles. These 12 were the 12 that Jesus chose out of the stock of Israel. Even though Paul was Jewish, Paul had, was given the special ministry of going to the Gentiles, though he still had a passionate zeal for his people to get saved. His primary mission was to non-Jewish lost people. These 12 apostles who were also Jewish, their primary focus was to the Jewish nation. And so there are, there are specific requirements for apostleship, but here's the thing. Paul was specifically called by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus called him. Jesus told him where to go and then sent someone from the church to baptize him scripturally, properly, according to scripture. And so we see here that, that the, not just anybody can be an apostle. And there's, there's no way in the 20 first century, or any century since the first century, early first century, that somebody could claim to be an apostle, apostle biblically. It's just not possible. Now, they can make things up, which they do a lot, and say, well, we're apostles, but they're not biblical apostles. But why is that so important? Because God gave the apostles special authority. God gave to them spe special sign gifts to authenticate the message that they were giving because these were, these were the group of men either who directly or through discipleship were going to pen the New Testament under inspiration of God. And they had special gifts that were given to them, special sign gifts. They could raise de the dead. They could heal the sick. They could, they could do s d different miracles. And those miracles were in place, these sign gifts. And we've talked about this before when we went through the book of Acts. These sign gifts were temporary gifts because to the to Jewish people, they seek, after, uh, evidence, they seek evidence that you're authentic, and that would usually be miracles. That's why Jesus worked miracles, not to razzle and dazzle the people, but to authenticate his message that he was from God. And once the New Testament was written, by, you know, we, we see the conclusion here, right before the end of the first century, 96 A.D., those sign gifts really ceased after the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. But by the, by the time you have the conclusion of the first century, there are no special sign gifts being practiced at all. They're done. Because primarily they were a message to the Jewish people that judgment was coming because of their rejection of the Messiah. And that, that judgment was completed in 70 A.D. when General Titus leveled not only Jerusalem but the temple and wiped them out and scattered them abroad and emptied the land of Israel of Jews. Just The Romans were done dealing with the Jews. They're like, we are done. We've had it. And they just exported the Jews all over the known world. And Israel was done because they rejected the Messiah. 
But after that time, there's, there's no evidence of any of sign gifts being in, employed or in power whatsoever. Um, but these apostles had special gifts given to them, and they were given a special authority by God. You see, you see Paul and, and different apostles going around, going from church to church. Kind of over, They were the overseers, kind of the watching over the incubation of the new churches that were popping up all over the known world at that time. And they were kind of the overseers to make sure. That's why Paul, Paul and different apostles, they were writing letters to try to correct error and keep the churches on the right path. As, as the first century is coming to a close and these churches are popping up all over. And you know, as, as with anything, when you start something new, you start on a journey, you want to make sure you're on the right track. I know when I was in surveying class a long, long time ago, it, it, it didn't, it, you might seem a small thing if, if I'm trying to you know, def, decide this, this property line. If I'm off just maybe a, a, a tenth of an inch, if my angle is off just a tenth of a degree here, well, that's not that big of a deal. But you go 500 feet, and that's a huge deal. And so God had given the, the apostles this authority to kind of look, watch over and, and try to keep the churches grounded and straight as, as they began because they were now their purpose and their mission is to start other churches. And, we, and God wanted to make sure that these churches were doctrinally sound. And so one of the things the apostles had to do was watch over them. Also, the apostles were going to be given the primary task of, of writing down the New Testament that God wanted to give to us. Uh, take a look at Acts chapter 1 and verse number 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto who? The apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So even after Jesus rose from the dead for forty days, he communed with primarily the apostles and gave them further instructions on what they were to do before he was taken up into heaven. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 12.28. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Paul here writing to the church at Corinth. Verse number 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first what? Apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles and gifts and healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? So there are different groups of people given to, given to the churches, but first of all, apostles. They were the ones that God had given that authority uh, to watch over the churches and, and ensure that they were being uh, started correctly and of that nature. But also God used many of the apostles to pen different books of the New Testament. Uh, so, one of the first tests was, was the author either an apostle or somebody who was a disciple or follower of an apostle, somebody who was under their authority, somebody who had the watchful eye of an apostle either directly writing, an apostle directly writing a, a, a book, like we have Matthew, uh, John, these were apostles, and they penned books. Uh, Paul was an apostle, and he penned half the New Testament. Uh, under inspiration of, of God. Uh, but some authors were not apostles, but they were, they were in company with the apostles, and the apostles were watching over them. And understand that these books were written and completed while there were still living apostles and first-generation disciples of the apostles, apostles still living by the time you have the completion of the entire New Testament. So that if there were things that were amiss or a, a writing that was not correct or a writing that had errors or had false doctrine in it, there were living, breathing people who either had the authority or were disciples of those that had the authority to look at a writing and say, uh-uh, that, that does not mesh with the doctrines and teachings of Jesus Christ. Because either I heard it personally as an apostle or I heard it from my, my teacher who was an apostle, and that, that's not going to fly. That's, that does not, that's not scripture. 
So very, very important to understand, because you're going to hear a lot of people say, well, some of these books weren't, weren't written until 150, 200 years after Jesus lived and died. That's a lie. All these books, and that's why, that's why it was written so quickly, because all these books were written under the guardianship and, and authority of the apostles to make sure that what we have in this Bible today is Scripture and not just a bunch of fanciful stories. Test number two, what did the local church think of these writings? What did the local churches think of these writings? Were they accepted within the circle of local churches? Now, you might add, ask yourself, well, which churches? Well, in the first century, there was just churches. It's not like we have today in our culture where we have the Baptist churches and the Lutheran churches and the Presbyterian churches and the Methodist churches and the Assembly of God churches and on and on and on we go. Back in those days, it was just the church at Corinth, the church at Philippi, the church at Jerusalem, the church at Rome. They were all the same. It's not until you get to the second, third centuries where you begin to have splits between churches. And there, well, there's the irregular churches, which eventually coalesced into what, was, what became known as the Catholic Church today. But you just had churches. They all had the same doctrine. They all had the same Bible. They all had the same beliefs. They were just churches. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be nice? There's so much confusion out there today, and why is that? Because Satan is a master of confusion. He cannot defeat the church, so he will just muddy the waters regarding church, much like the Word of God. He can't ever get rid of this book, but he can certainly confuse the daylights out of people regarding the book. Yes? And he accompanied with Paul on many of his journeys. So, also with regard to Mormon athletics, now Joseph Smith claims to have had a vision in 1820, 't corroborate it yep yep absolutely many times people talk about you know how many have read some of Shakespeare's writings Now, people accept that as Shakespeare's writings. There's no doubt, there's no arguments, and there's no qualms. Understand, we have barely any of the original writings of Shakespeare, but it's accepted as fact. We have hundreds and hundreds of times more manuscript evidence to back up the King James Bible. Yeah, yeah people scratch their head and go, well, I'm not so sure. It's just a, it's a, it's a heart issue. I don't want to accept that this is true, because if I accept this is true, then I'm accountable to an authority, and I don't want to be told what to do. I want to do what I want to do. That's one of the primary genesis of evolution. Understand, Charles Darwin, Darwin was exceptionally bitter towards the Bible and, and Christianity, and he concocted a system whereby we, he could explain everything that we see without God. And how many millions upon me, millions of people are in hell because of the teachings of Darwin. It's wicked. It's, it's spiritual warfare. But yes, we, have, we'd have, we, we do not have a blind faith in holding to the King James Bible. We do not have a blind faith in believing that the 66 books of the Bible are God-inspired scripture. We have many, 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 many times over evidence to back up our faith. It's not a blind faith. 
It's, it's a faith that we can have confidence in. We, it's a faith where we can be intellectually honest with people and say there is evidence to back up what we hold in our hands, that it is the Word of God. And that it's, it's been preserved just like God promised to do down through the centuries, and it is intact, and it is what we should govern our lives and our churches by. Colossians 4.16 Colossians 4.16. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now I found this interesting because apparently there was an epistle written to the church at Laodicea that we, it didn't make the cut. It didn't end up in the Bible. Because is there a book of Laodicea, an epistle to the Laodiceans? No. Now, there was, a, there was a letter written that we know about to the Laodiceans because of Revelation chapter 3 says to the, to the angel at Laodicea or to the pastor at Laodicea. But that wasn't written until the late 90s. Understand, Colossians was written... In between 60 and 62 AD, so it's not talking about Revelation. But here was the custom of that first century. Letters that were written to one church were then circulated and given to another church, and so not just the church at Colossae got to read the epistle of, to the Colossians. Many churches got to read that. And in so doing, they came to understand and accept that this is Scripture, this is inspired, and it is going to be included in the canon of the New Testament as the complete New Testament. Not only was there the uh, apostolic authorship or authority or influence on the writing, that was a test, but also another test was, is this letter or is this book accepted widely amongst the churches of the day? Is it, is it accepted? If, they, if all of a sudden somebody pulls out, hey, how about this book? And they're like, what is that book? We've never even heard of that book. It's never been heard of in any churches. That's not going to pass the test because they had no idea what that book was all about. And understand, there were writings going on at that time in the first century. Paul made mention of, I believe, in Galatians where he says, uh, you know, talking about how there was other uh, letters written in his name that he had never written. Even in the first century, before even the apostles passed off the scene, people were trying to forge new documents and try to pass them off as apostolic in nature. And Paul said, uh, that's not mine. And so that not only was the apostles very integral in, in uh, filtering through some of the writings to make sure that the legitimate ones got through, but the local churches played a part in making sure that that was right and that was so. Thirdly, uh, church fathers' recognition played a part. Another test was the church fathers. Had the disciples of the apostles quoted from them at all? Was there, uh, what was their opinion of them uh, Case in point, Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John. Uh, he's, he, we can read the writings of Polycarp, and he quotes many of the writings of the apostles and quotes them in the different letters that he wrote and the different uh, sermons that he preached. Uh, and so he's, he's making reference to those writings bearing validity to them being Scripture. Uh, New Testament books were also vetted by the apostles and their first-generation disciples personally. Test number four. What is the book's subject matter? What is the book's subject matter? What did the book teach? Did it contradict other recognized scriptural books? So again, scrutiny was being placed upon these writings that were out there in the first century, and uh, they, they subjected these books to a test. Did it mesh 100% without error with the other known scriptures that they had in hand? And if it deviated even a little bit, it was out. If it did not agree with all the other teachings, that's the that's beauty of the book called the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, there are no contradictions. None. You see a common thread through all the Old Testament books that line up perfectly and integrate seamlessly with the teachings of the New Testament. You have examples and pictures and illustrations in the Old Testament that are, that are foreshadowings of the doctrines that we came to receive in the New Testament. And, and everything just, it meshes together perfectly. And where, where you don't understand something, that's not God's issue, it's our issue. 
and we just need to pray and ask God, to, may your Holy Spirit reveal to me, help me understand. I mean, there's portions of Scripture today that I still read, and it's like, I know that Scripture, God, but one of these days you're going to show me what that, what that's, what that really means and what it's for. Because, ah, I mean, I've been, I've been saved since I was 16 years old and reading the Bible for a long, long time. And I'm not afraid to admit there's many things in here that I still scratch my head about and go, and they're like, oh, no, you have questions about the Bible? Yeah, because I'm being honest. But that doesn't mean I just throw it down and say, eh. because the few things that I still struggle to understand pale in comparison to all the things that God has helped me to see, and it just bolsters my faith and strengthens my faith. Because I've seen God time and time again bless me as I read something and say, I need to obey that and apply it to my life, and God blesses. And God, does that, mean I'm, does, not, does that mean I never have problems? Oh, absolutely not. The more you obey the Bible, the more problems you'll have. Because the world out there doesn't want you to live according to the Bible, and the enemy doesn't want you to live according to the Bible. So you'll have struggles, you'll have challenges, but the God of the Bible will be there with you. And the Word of God can be a comfort to you in those difficult times, and those challenging times. It's a win-win. The more you read the Bible, the better off you'll be. The better off you are, the more resistance you'll have from the enemy, which just drives you back into the book to get more comfort and get more knowledge, and you get a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger. And so it's, it's a wonderful book. No book, any, uh, no book like it on the entire planet. Uh, number five, does this book, and good segue into that, does this book, does these, do these books have the ability to inspire, to convict, and to edify the local congregations. That was another test. They put this, these books through. Do these books have the ability to inspire, to convict, to uh, edify the people that will read it and hear it? That is the test that they applied. And a large uh, group of writings or books that did not pass the cut... Um, we talked about this, I believe, two weeks ago. A little bit I made mention of it is the Apocrypha. Uh, the Apocrypha is a, a collection of books written sometime during that dark period um, of the, the 400 silent years. Uh, the Apocrypha was in existence at the time that Jesus walked the planet, uh, but unanimously had been rejected by all the people that had a position to reject it. Uh, including at that time Jesus and even um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, the Apocrypha is made up of uh, 14 books, 1st and 2nd Esdras, Tobit, Judith, Remainder of Esther, so-called, Wisdom of Solomon, not really, Ecclesiasticus, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Baruch, Song of the Three Children, Story of Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, Prayer of Manassas. So, these books did not make the cut. Uh, these books, uh, like I said, were in existence at the time of Jesus. He never quoted from them once. Not once. Uh, the Pharisees rejected these books. The Pharisees were the ones who were the lawyers, the, the, uh, the, those that understood the law better than anybody. They rejected them. Uh, also, you might hear in, in modern times, there's, there's the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas. Uh, these are false Gospels that are heavily... Uh, Gnostic in nature, of course, Gnosticism is that anything physical is evil, only spiritual is good, and you don't actually need spiritual cleansing, you just need more knowledge. Your salvation comes in knowledge, not in forgiveness of sins. That's Gnosticism. You see that in a lot of different things called religious today in our culture, and it's very, very heavily influencing uh, certain groups of churches even, so-called um, that this Gnostic teaching that you just need to have more knowledge, and through that knowledge it'll set you free. Uh, but it's just a bunch of satanic garbage. Um, so, reasons for rejecting the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha never, was never accepted by any recognized Jewish authority. Uh, Pharisees, Jesus, some of the prophets, Old Testament prophets, never quoted by Jewish authority, Jesus, or any, old, or, or any, or any New Testament writers. Josephus, a first century Jewish person, though most likely he was not saved, even he rejected it as being authoritative. A well-known Jewish philosopher, Philo, also rejected it. 
Early church fathers rejected it. And this is interesting. Jerome, who, under the direction of the Pope, wrote the Latin Vulgate for the Catholic Church, even Jerome didn't agree with the Apocrypha, but under direction of the Pope, was told to put them in there anyway. So in the Catholic Bible, all the books of the Apocrypha are scattered in, in and around the, 30, the 66 books that we know. If you pick up a Catholic Bible, in there is 14 more books. Or in cases like es the remainder of Esther is just kind of glommed on to the end of Esther. There. Uh, but there, all throughout the Catholic Bible, you'll see these other 14 books, and they're, they're used as authoritative scripture within the Catholic Church. Um, none of these 14, this is interesting, none of these 14 books claim inspiration. Uh, several books contain historical and geographical errors. No apocryphal book can be found in any listing of canonical books before the 4th century. So long after we had the complete canon of New Testament scripture, not a single book from the Apocrypha ever showed up on any list, ever, for the first four centuries. So they were rejected. Now, and I I'd made mention of this, and you might have seen it in, in some, of the, uh, some of the King James Bibles that Brother Walker had here. When the King James translators completed their work uh, for just kind of cultural and historical significance, they included in between the Old and New Testament the apocryphal books. But they put them there all together in one place in the middle and made very clear that these were not scripture, but they were just doing it there, putting it there just for cultural purposes, really. But by the time they got to the, one of the editions, they had dropped out. They just like, no, nope, we're taking them out because they're not scripture. But if you ever see a, a, like a facsimile of an, of an original King, 1611 King James Bible, don't be shocked if you see the apocryphal books in between the Old and New Testament. They were not saying in any way that these are scripture. They were just, because even at that time, they were so widely accepted, because by the, by the time you have Jerome writing the Latin Vulgate, which predates the King James Bible, uh, it was very culturally accepted, and the Catholic Church was promoting that these are scripture. And so you've got to understand, by the time you get around to the 1611, you know, the, whole, the whole culture is just driven into their head, these are scripture. And, and, and it, would have been a, it would have been a shock and dismay to see a Bible without those, so the King James translators put them in the middle just to scratch the itch of society, but they took them out eventually as they, as they continued to update spellings and things of that nature, uh, and had that, that 17, early 1700 edition that that got all the typesetting right and, and the spelling solidified and stabilized and all that stuff. So by the time that happened, they're just like, yeah, we're taking it out because it doesn't belong in there in the first place. So that is how we came to have these 66 books in the Bible you hold in your hands. And Lord willing, next week we'll begin to dive into the manuscripts that underlie the English Bible that we have in our hands today. Father, we just thank you for the time we've had this morning to look into the history of, of how you have kept your promise to preserve your word and use different people, even though they were sinful and though they were imperfect. Lord, you are perfect and your word is perfect and your plan is perfect and your power is perfect. And you have kept for us every word that you wanted us to have. And I just thank you for that and just ask that you'd be with the morning service, be with pastors as you preach us. And I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts and challenge us where we need to be challenged convict us where we need to be convicted and if there's anybody with us that needs to be saved oh dear lord would you please save them today and we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise and ask it in jesus name amen you are dismissed